couple of months. Now, e-cigarettes, the global market, uh, the global value of the market for electronic cigarettes is estimated at up to $3 billion each year and is growing rapidly with predictions that sales will top $10 billion annually within five years. But are they, as their proponents claim, a healthier alternative that can help people give up harmful tobacco while keeping a relatively safe nicotine hit? Or could they represent a gateway product luring more people into addiction? We'll be discussing those issues in a moment, but first, Barry Cummins takes a look at what exactly e-cigarettes are and the implications of their current regulation-free sale. E-cigarettes are becoming ever more visible, ever more popular. Also known as vaporizers, they give a nicotine hit without any tobacco. When you have a craving, you, you puff on it and you deliver the, the craving. Currently, they are unregulated. We have to know what they contain and we have to look and see that they work. The industry needs to be able to regulate itself rather than the restrictive legislation that has been imposed by the EU. This room in Sabrina McGonagall's home in Dublin is the centre of her e-cigarette business. This is uh, part of the starter kit that we would sell. This is the part where you put the e-liquid into and you'll just fill the bottom of it up with the e-liquid and then the battery will burn the element which will vaporise the liquid. A tobacco-filled cigarette contains thousands of chemicals. One of those is nicotine, the addictive element which gets people hooked. An e-cigarette has no tobacco. The nicotine is in liquid form and is mixed with three agents, vegetable glycerin, polyethylene glycol and a flavouring. When someone takes a puff on an e-cigarette, part of the liquid turns to vapour and is drawn into the mouth, giving a dose of nicotine. You're still getting the throat hit, you're still getting the vapour coming out of your mouth, you're still doing the thing with your hand. Like a lot of giving up the cigarettes is actually to do with habit with habit putting your hand to mouth and the vapour and everything else, whereas you're getting those without all the chemicals. Just like governments across the globe, the medical profession is still getting to grips with this device. It's fair to say that taking a nicotine in, in this way to an electronic cigarette might contribute to reducing harm. The difficulty at the moment is that we're not sure what they contain. There isn't any regulation of the market. There's probably over a couple, over 200 products available as, as far as I'm aware. Um, the amount of nicotine within them, the other chemicals that are contained in the propellants, these, uh, these products, we don't know what the impact of those in the longer term is. And I suppose then we do have concerns about where the electronic cigarette market is going in that it is now, uh, it is now very much in the clutches of, of the tobacco industry. In the absence of any regulation, e-cigarettes are currently sold over the counter in shops across the country, including Carmel Fells newsagents at Rose Lawn in Dublin. The customers are demanding that we, that we carry this kind of type of product because there are so many people trying to cut the habit and it is mostly for health reasons rather than anything else. Cigarettes, as you know, that we are not allowed to display or even um, talk about cigarettes or tobacco we're introducing to anybody um, when the new regulations come in. Um, the difference with these cigarettes is because they're not considered as the tar that, that, that is in the actual cigarettes, they're a different thing, they're more like a health, a health conscious um, product. So this, is, this is the reason why that we are allowed to, to um, display them and um, be able to introduce them. That's the big question. How do you categorise an e-cigarette? At the moment, it's considered a consumer product. There are discussions at EU level on whether it should be labelled a medical device. In the absence of any government guidelines here, one third level institute has decided e-cigarettes should be restricted to designated smoking areas. We didn't want to confuse the situation whereby you're asking people who are smoking nicotine products to desist and in circumstances where they may point to somebody maybe 10 or 15 yards away who would appear to be also smoking a nicotine product. It may well be an e-cigarette, but it's very difficult to distinguish at distance. There were no arguments that we could see from our research to suggest that they were harmless products. Um, and my understanding is that the jury is actually out on that particular issue. During our visit to DIT, we found a few smokers, but no one with an e-cigarette. Stephen, uh, you've tried e-cigarettes? Yeah, I have, yeah. What's your experience? Uh, 
they're not the same. They give you quite a bad cough, in fairness. Uh, I had one and when I was in sixth year, and it was uh, a few of my friends had them as well, and they uh, all of them gave them up because they get you do get a bad cough after about two weeks. I think uh, they didn't they ban them in France. Kind of. A French court ruled that e-cigarettes were similar to tobacco products and should be sold in tobacconists. The ruling is being appealed, but it shows how in the absence of an EU-wide strategy, different governments and courts are grappling with this device. The Department of Health told Primetime there is a lack of research in relation to the long-term health effects of e-cigarettes and a lack of sufficient evidence that they aid with smoking cessation. Later this year, a new EU-wide tobacco directive will set mandatory safety and quality requirements for e-cigarettes, including nicotine content. These products definitely need to be out of the hands of, of, uh, of, of children and young adults because that's when, it, that's when nicotine addiction starts. If, for example, a 13, 14 year old comes in and, and sees this product and says... Absolutely that. not. There's still the same rule applies that um, nobody under 18 years of age is allowed to, to um, purchase any type of tobacco product. We would consider that a tobacco product, even though probably a lot of people wouldn't. If e-cigarettes were classified as a medical device, their sale might be restricted to pharmacies. News agents are keen to keep this profitable item on their shelves. Our bone of contention has always been that how little one makes on the normal tobacco product. So this gives everyone a the chance then of making a little bit more money, plus the fact that we are advocating um, a good product in e-cigarettes to help people with their health. Lenny McMillian has been using an e-cigarette for the last few weeks. I can breathe better. I can start tasting food again <laughs> properly. And I thought I'd be a sports person, so that's, that's, that's going to help me to get, get back fit again, to like that. It's a good, it's a good day for, for people that's, that, that want to stop, but it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's, it's still willpower all the same. Though. You could have a bit of willpower to, to do anything in life. It might be a very good opportunity for, uh, to, to get people off cigarettes, but as I said, it has to be really in a regulated environment. We have to know what they contain, and we have to look and see that they work. Barry Cummins reporting there. So are e-cigarettes a good thing and how much regulation should they be subjected to? Joining me now in studio, Kathleen O'Mara of the Irish Cancer Society and Darrow Lachlan of the Irish Pharmacy Union. While from London, we're joined by Clive Bates, who's a former director of the anti-smoking group ASH in the UK, but thinks that e-cigarettes should be as freely available as possible. Clive Bates, why do you think they're a good thing? Well, they've got, you know, they're incredibly popular. They substitute for cigarettes and uh, probably 99 to 100% less risky. And we all, despite what it said in the package, we already know quite a lot about what's in them, how effective they are as alternatives to smoking, how, uh, you know, how many contaminants they have in them. They're pretty safe products. So you have to have a massively contorted logic before you can find something that's an alternative to cigarettes, but 99% less risky, a bad thing. So I think they're a good thing. People like them, they want to switch to them, and frankly, the more smokers that convert, the better. But they're a relatively new product, so therefore, by definition, as was said in the, uh, in the report by Dr Ross Morgan of Ash Ireland, we don't actually know what the long-term effects might be. Well, obviously, we don't know, you know what, what the effects will be over the next 50 years until 50 years has passed. But that doesn't mean we don't know anything. Uh, in fact, we already know more about what's in these products than what's in cigarette smoke itself. Um, we, we know just from the physics and chemistry of what goes into an e-cigarette that they cannot be that harmful. They contain, as, as the package said, they contain very simple ingredients. There, are, there is no combustion processes, so you don't get thousands of products of combustion that you get in smoke. So you don't get the small particles of burning tar, you don't get the toxic volatile gases, you just get warmed up vapour. Um, you know, of liquid and propylene glycol, which is used in pharmaceuticals. Nicotine itself is not particularly harmful. It's got the same sort of risk profile that uh, caffeine has. So when you strip it down, there isn't that much to be worried about. Okay, but well, there's a, an industry of developed in the public health community of creating a lot of sort of fear and panic about this that is mostly unwarranted. OK, well, Kathleen O'Mara, uh, to a layperson, uh, it, it seems fairly straightforward. They've got to be better for you than cigarettes. Well, if every smoker uh, took up e-cigarettes instead of tobacco and if then they gave up smoking, 
then I think undoubtedly e-cigarettes would have to be seen as a very good thing. But there, we, we, we're very suspicious, in fact, that that's not what's happening here. Um, and the main reason is because the tobacco industry appears to be moving in and taking over the e-cigarette industry. But that's, industry. I mean, that, that, that's, that's not necessarily the, the point. I mean, the point is these have got to be better for you than smoking mm -hmm. tobacco, so therefore they have to be, on balance, a good thing, or at least a better thing, than cigarettes. Undoubtedly, they're better than smoking cigarettes because, like you say, they don't contain tobacco and they don't contain, or they, don't, they certainly don't seem to contain the 4,000 or so chemicals that a cigarette does. However... Uh, they are being marketed in a way, in a way very similar to how cigarettes were marketed when it was legal to advertise cigarettes, and they are also being portrayed, I think, not so much as a as a smoking cessation uh, tool, but rather as a something you can smoke as well as smoking cigarettes. So, in other words, that to get around the smoking bans, you know, that you can continue to smoke inside, and also what we would be very concerned about is that what we're now seeing is a lot of the visualisation of smoking or the, the, what we call the real normalisation of smoking because these are so widely available. So are you looking for these to be uh, treated as if they're some kind of a medicinal product, that they would be subject to those kind of controls and restrictions? Preferably, yes. But, um, you know, if, if they're treated as a, as, a food, as a food product would be, mm -hmm. for instance, they would be tested and we would know what was in them and yes. everything, wouldn't that be enough? And we don't know that at the moment. Uh, and, we, and, and consumers, you know, even if we just take it as a consumer product, are very much entitled to, to that as a basic minimum. But we're not talking about a food item here. We're talking about nicotine. And even though Clive says that nicotine, you know, is about the same as caffeine, I don't think that's actually the case. And nicotine is a highly oh, addictive a product. And nicotine is what has smokers smoke. OK, Clive, do you want to respond to that? Well... I mean, it's not me that says that uh, nicotine has the same health risks as caffeine. That's sort of fairly widely established amongst the uh, experts in nicotine science. I mean, I just want to pick up some of those points. I mean, the, the idea of advertising um, uh, e-cigarettes e in a way that is sort of creates a buzz and is a bit of creates a bit of excitement around them, that should be seen as positive for health, because that, what that's doing is encouraging people to switch from smoking to this much more uh, much less dangerous alternative. And the fact that some of the cigarettes look a bit sort of, uh, so, sorry, some of the e-cigarette adverts look a bit sort of cool and sexy, that's not a bad thing. And it's not surprising, given that they're there to uh, appeal to smokers. But, I mean, but if you about... want to classify them as medicines and make all the advertising look like advertising for athletes' foot cream, so be it. But don't expect so many people to convert. But is, isn't the point that Kathleen makes a, a, a reasonable one, that a lot of people, uh, smokers, might decide that they don't want to go out into the cold when they're in the pub. Uh, they want to stay inside. So instead of having a cigarette, they'll have an e-cigarette, but then they'll go back to smoking a fag when they're on the way home. What, what you tend to see is you get a bit of that, and actually that's often an initial reason why people take up e-cigarettes, as well as the fact that it's less antisocial, that it costs less, and there's a whole lot of other benefits. But what happens is, once they've started to do that, they, get, they start to move completely over to e-cigarettes. So that is something that starts, is the beginning of a journey from being a, a full-on smoker to being a dual user to being a full-on vapor. And, you know, you have to let people find their way to these products in the way that suits them, not just criticise them for every step that they take. OK, Dara, I want to bring you in. Um, the pharmaceutical industry across Europe is trying to have this fairly, these fairly strictly regulated and obviously um, presumably only available from a pharmacy, for instance. So presumably it's in your self-interest uh, to go along with that, isn't it? We aren't advocating that these should be available only from pharmacies. What we're saying is that today there's no quality assurance, there's no regulation, there's no guarantee that what it says on the pack is what it contains inside. There are no, clinical, no proper scientific clinical trials to say this is an effective smoking cessation aid. So if you take the other sort of nicotine replacement products that can be purchased in a pharmacy, like the gum, the patches, the inhaler and so on, all of those are fully regulated by the medicines authorities. There's quality assurance, there's quality control. We know they do what it says on the packet because there are clinical trials that have been submitted to governments to demonstrate that they're safe and they're effective. With these things, you are working in the dark. You don't know how much nicotine is in the product when you get it. You don't know how much nicotine is in each puff you inhale. 
What we're saying is that they have to be regulated from a safety perspective. Take away where you sell them, strip out all of the economic stuff, but from a safety perspective, a patient safety perspective, and a public health perspective, you need to know what the thing is, you need to know yeah. what's in it, you need to know how it works. But at the moment you have an absolute monopoly over the gum and the patches and the inhalers and all the rest of it. So, you know, are you, are you seriously telling me that your members wouldn't be worried about these being sold in uh, news agents? Pharmacies don't sell these products because they're not regulated. They don't sell them because there's no quality assurance. They don't sell them because they're not prepared to put their professional reputation behind a product that doesn't itself have any quality or safety data. So if they were regulated, would pharmacies sell them? If they were regulated and demonstrated to be safe, if they could show that they are an effective aid to smoking cessation, then they would become part of the service. So pharmacies will continue to deliver smoking cessation products. These could be another so product. So you're not at all worried about uh, news agents uh, taking away a, a very large part of your... These aren't being purchased by people that want to quit smoking. They're being purchased, even as Clive has said, by people that want to transfer, transition from one smoking product to another. All the other nicotine products that you get in a the pharmacy, they're for people who smoke today and want to be smoke-free. They want to be nicotine-free. It's about weaning yourself off. It's the transition from being a smoker to being an ex-smoker. These e-cigarettes are as likely to turn you into an ex-smoker as they are to turn an ex-smoker back into a smoker. But surely, even if you cut down by one cigarette and replace it with an e-cigarette, you're doing better. Small reductions in the amount of cigarettes or the number of cigarettes that you smoke in a day don't really have a knock-on effect on your health. There's no such thing as a safe level of smoking. If you're on 15 a day or you're on 8 cigarettes a day, it's equally bad for you. OK, Kathleen, um, if there are uh, regulations introduced, mm -hmm. I mean, the European Commission admits that this will make e-cigarettes more expensive uh, and therefore people will be slower to take them up so they'll continue smoking ordinary cigarettes, presumably. Surely that's a bad thing. Well, if they're being seen as, uh, you know, as an effective way to have people give up smoking and to reduce the rate of illness from smoking, well, then I think there's a case to be made for a government to make them far more affordable, to make them genuinely affordable. Uh, but if they're being regulated as a medicine and if they're being seen as a smoking cessation product, I don't think that's what's happening right now. Um, I think they're being seen as something that people will smoke alongside uh, tobacco. Um, and also, you know, what worries me is, and I, was, I met a woman last week who had successfully given up a really difficult habit of 60 a day and who had started on, has now started on e-cigarettes and is really genuinely worried that her nicotine addiction is, is back and she'll, she'll go back on cigarettes. That's, that's another uh, thing to be concerned about, uh, that the availability of these is, is a, a demotivator to quit and potentially could encourage people to go back on cigarettes. But is there anything, from a health point of view, is there anything intrinsically wrong with long-term use of e-cigarettes? Well, we don't know. We just don't know at the moment. OK, well, Clive, um, in effect, I mean, it was mentioned before that the, uh, all of the big tobacco firms are piling on board this new trend as quickly as they, they can. And the worry would be that people are being asked, in effect, to trust the tobacco industry, which uh, hasn't really had a great record over the past century or so. Well, the, the first thing is that so far they've hardly been involved at all. I mean, they're quite late to the party, to be honest. Um, what they've found is that their customers have been switching over to these products. I mean, all the investment analysts are very worried that the companies are losing sales, that it's all bad for them. So, in, you know, in the, in the places where they count the money, they do think that people are cutting down on smoking and reducing the amount of uh, cigarettes that are being bought. So the tobacco companies are moving into this. But in some ways, that's a positive development. Um, you know, I, I don't think we want the tobacco companies always to be selling products that kill people. It'd be quite good if they sold products that didn't kill people. It'd be better than what they do now. So I, I'm not sure I see the problem in the same way that other people do. Um, and of course, you don't trust the tobacco companies. But the fact that they're getting into this category is a positive development. You know, and fr frankly, there are other big grisly players involved as well. I mean, we've just heard a whole lot of special pleading from the pharmaceutical industry, uh, you know, who want as, as much regulatory barriers and protection as they possibly can for the products that they have that actually don't really work very well. Okay, what well, they're it's... frightened of is that what they're really frightened of here is a consumer product the consumers want to buy, they find is a good alternative to cigarettes, so the tobacco companies are frightened of, of that. They find it's uh, more effective than getting people to stop smoking than NRT, so the pharmaceutical industry is afraid of that. So you've got these big industry lobbies piling in on this, trying to get more and more regulation to squash these companies who are being innovative and bringing new products okay. to the market that smokers actually like. OK, Darren, quick, quick, Darren, quick, quick response to that. 
Look, if this is not about trying to put regulatory burdens in place. It's about safety. If these things are safe, prove it. If your friends in the tobacco industry think that they're safe, they have the budget to go out and prove it. They can afford a clinical trial as easily as any pharmaceutical okay, company. Okay, and Kathleen, in a word, uh, better for the tobacco companies to be invested yeah. in this than an ordinary cigarette. The cigarettes. tobacco industry has never, ever, ever, ever had any interest in public health. Quite okay. the opposite. All right, okay, well, thank you all indeed uh, for joining us.